While on a road trip, an elderly couple stopped at a roadside restaurant for lunch, but he was not happy about anything they experienced there. He wasn't happy with the meal. He wasn't happy with the service. He wasn't happy with, happy with the atmosphere. He just complained and grumped the entire time and made the meal miserable for her. They uh, finished up the meal, left the restaurant, resumed their trip, Uh, But the elderly woman didn't realize that she had left her glasses on the table at the restaurant until they were about 40 miles down the road. When she discovered it, at that point, there was going to be about an hour and a half extra time and travel that would be added to their trip. Now he was really unhappy. All the way back to the restaurant, he complained and scolded his wife for her forgetfulness. She tried to change the subject to happier topics, but he kept reminding her how much time and how much extra gas this was going to cost them. To her relief, they finally arrived at the restaurant. As she got out of the car and hurried in to retrieve her glasses, he rolled down the window and yelled after her, While you're in there... You might as well get my hat. (laughs) Does it seem that some people are never happy? Whatever the circumstances, they find something to complain about. But we don't want to be that person, do we? We want to be happy. In fact, in our culture, we have been taught to pursue happiness. It is, after all, a constitutional right guaranteed to every American citizen to pursue the happiness, and we have done so relentlessly. In ancient Greece, there was actually a goddess of happiness. Her name was Euphrosyne, and here's an image of her. There are not very many, but this is one of the few statues that exist of her. When she is depicted either by statues or in paintings, uh, she's usually depicted dancing, which is kind of a universal expression of happiness, isn't it? Some people just dance spontaneously when they are happy. We call that doing their happy dance. And uh, Euphrosyne was the goddess of happiness, and and she demonstrated that. She was, however, in that culture, a minor god. In our culture, happiness is a major god. We have embarked upon a sermon series for this summer entitled, No Other Gods. And we will spend the rest of this summer exploring some of the contemporary gods that We as a people tend to worship, whether we recognize it as worship or not, whether we recognize them as gods or not. This morning, we're going to look at the God of personal enjoyment, or you might say the God of happiness. Most of us are guided by this personal objective to be happy. I want to be happy is kind of a mantra that if not repeated verbally, at least uh, works through our mind. And happiness is still a God today. It turns out that happiness is a demanding God. You may remember the definition that we gave a God in the beginning part of this series of sermons uh, was not necessarily something that you would bow down to as far as a stone or wooden idol, not necessarily an image, but a God is anything that we serve. It is anything that we sacrifice to or sacrifice for. A God that we worship is whatever it is that is the number one priority or the number one pursuit in our life. Some people live with happiness as that greatest goal. In pursuit of happiness, they eat too much, they drink too much, they party too much. In the pursuit of happiness, we might be tempted to trade our marriage partner for sexual flings. In the pursuit of happiness, we might be tempted to trade in our savings account or our retirement fund for something that we want right now. In our pursuit of happiness, we might be tempted to trade in the drudgery of our responsibilities and commitments for some pleasure that's dangling in front of our eyes. And the result of that is we become less dependable. 
Our plans will change on a whim to suit our felt needs. Our desire for happiness demands that. The God of happiness insists on being the top priority of our lives. But ironically, no matter how we pursue, no matter how hard or how frequently we pursue happiness, happiness is an elusive God. Even secular psychologists agree that happiness is elusive. Uh, in preparation for this sermon this week, I read several articles on happiness and, and, and how elusive it is and how we might obtain happiness. And I've lifted some of the quotes uh, from, from this article, from the articles I read that, that tell us that happiness is not uh, an objective that is easily found. Some, someone's wrote, happiness is not sustainable. Someone said happiness is fleeting. Another author said happiness is merely a myth. And then I read in one article something that I heard several times in the past. Using an analogy, happiness is like a butterfly. The more you chase it, the faster it flies away from you. In other words, it's elusive. In the July 2020 issue of Psychology Today, author Frank McAndrew wrote of the elusiveness of happiness. He concluded we are programmed to be dissatisfied. In other words, nothing fulfills us, nothing satisfies us, nothing makes us happy for very long before we find that we're unhappy again and we need something else to restore that feeling of elation. As an example, he related that when he finally published a book, he was elated about that, but that elation quickly faded away. He said he went from thinking of himself as a guy who wrote a book to a guy who wrote Only one book. (laughs) He wasn't happy about that any longer. There was something else now that he saw that might make him happy. And it appears the experts are correct. Lasting happiness eludes us. Happiness is a difficult God to serve. Solomon discovered that. He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, we think, in his older age of life. And it's kind of a spiritual diary of his pursuit of happiness. How that in an attempt to find fulfillment of life and happiness in life, he experienced um, one thing after another, afforded himself one luxury after another, attempted one activity after another, all in order to be happy. But he found that it was a fruitless endeavor. It was a futile search. In chapter 2, he gives us some of the examples of what he attempted to do in order to bring happiness into his life. In verse 3 of that chapter, he wrote, I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with, with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. In other words, he said, I, I, I experimented with alcohol. I drank a little just to, just to feel good, and, and then I, I drank even more, just to, to the point of acting foolish, uh, all the while still maintaining some type of restraint, but that didn't do it for him. And so, in verses 4 through 6, he tells us he took another avenue. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. He tried construction projects. He built himself new homes. He built orchards and parks and even built himself these nice fishing lakes. But that didn't bring him happiness either. And then he tells us in verses 7 and 8, I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. And so he attempted to find happiness through wealth and possessions and people who would meet his every need. But that wasn't satisfying either. And in the rest of verse 8, he tells us, I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well. The delights of a man's heart. That part doesn't need much explanation, does it? But even that didn't bring him the satisfaction he was seeking. It didn't make him happy for very long. And so he kind of 
wraps that all up in verse 10 by telling us, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. He went all in to try to be happy. But nothing brought him lasting happiness. And so in the next verse, he revealed his discovery about that pursuit as we read in verse 11. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, like chasing after the wind. That last phrase especially describes the pursuit of happiness. It's like chasing after the wind. If you've ever tried to do that, or if you could imagine trying to do that, how successful are you at capturing it? Just when you think you've grabbed it and you've got a handful of it and you open your hands, there is nothing there. That's what Solomon is telling us that the pursuit of happiness leads to. It is futility. And the problem was that Solomon was pursuing the wrong God just as many others are. His conclusion about the whole experience is recorded in Ecclesiastes 5, verses 18 through 20. This is what I have observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, This is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life. That means the the bad days, the troublesome times. Because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that where we think the pursuit of happiness should lead? The point that Solomon is making here is he's telling us that happiness is not God. But instead, God grants happiness. Happiness is a gift from God. It is not the product of our pursuit of it. You see, God wants us to enjoy the blessings that he gives us. Let's look at verse 19 again in that last section of the scripture. When God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. God wants us to have enjoyment. He wants us to have a happy life. But we must keep the proper perspective on happiness. We do that by, first of all, not confusing Our priorities. God is our number one pursuit. And we keep the proper perspective on the pursuit of happiness. Secondly, by realizing that all blessings come from God, not from the pursuit of happiness. We can easily identify what are the priorities in our lives by examining our checkbook. Just as simple as that. Or whatever other record of transactions you might keep that record your expenses. If you examine that, we can easily identify what are the priorities in our lives. There are always expenses that are necessities amongst those in those transactions. We, we spend uh, necessary money on uh, rent and mortgage payments or food and clothing and and uh, utilities to heat the home, and maybe gas to put in our automobile to travel back and forth to work. But it's how we spend our discretionary money that tells the story of our priorities. For example, do we spend so much money on our hobbies and our enjoyment that we can't afford to tithe? If so... That's an indication that our priorities are misordered. And it's an indication that we have begun to serve the God of happiness. God offers us the gift of happiness. Don't treasure the gift more than you treasure the giver. 
Happiness is not the product of the pursuit of happiness. But instead, happiness is the product of the pursuit of righteousness. Let's look at another scripture. Psalm 68, verses 1 through 4. May God arise. May his enemies be scattered. May his foes flee before him. May you blow them away like smoke as wax melts before the fire. May the wicked perish before God. But may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God. Sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him. His name is the Lord. Let's leave that up for just a couple of minutes. Look at the order of the way this psalm is written. First, it's praise of God, lifting God up and and, and attributing to him the honor that he is due, praising God and wishing for him the the, the honor that worldwide uh, that, that he deserves. And then we turn to the happiness of the righteous. And that's the formula. God first and our happiness second. The righteous do that. They put God first, and then happiness is granted to us. Even secular psychologists admit that happiness is a byproduct. A long-term study conducted through Harvard University discovered that two things bring happiness. First of all, good relationships. And secondly, worthwhile activity. The Bible says the same thing. Happiness is found in good relationships and worthwhile activity. But the Bible defines what is meant by good relationships and worthwhile activity. For the Bible tells us that we find happiness in a right relationship with God, the best relationship of all. And we find righteousness or happiness in righteous living, the most worthwhile of activities. So the pursuit of God, a relationship with him, and the pursuit of righteousness, living in righteousness, is the key to happiness. Why is that the case? It's because in pursuing those two things, we fulfill our created purpose. We were created for that. And happiness is closely related to feeling fulfilled. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 5, verse 6. Blessed, or some translations use the word happy. Blessed or happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. They will be satisfied. They will be happy. It is the pursuit of righteousness that brings happiness. You see, God wills for us, first of all, holiness. And then he grants us happiness. And so without God, and without God's will in our lives, there will be no lasting happiness. That's why we read these words in Job chapter 20, verse 5. The mirth of the wicked is brief. The joy of the godless lasts but a moment. But for the godly, as we saw in Psalm 68, 3, the righteous will be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Happiness is found in seeking God and his right ways. And when we do that, then happiness is granted to us by him as a gift, enjoy the gift. In 1998, Ann Wells wrote the following article in the Los Angeles Times. My brother-in-law opened the bottom drawer of my sister's bureau and lifted out a tissue-wrapped package. He discarded the tissue and handed me the contents. It was an exquisite silk slip, slip, handmade and trimmed with a cobweb of lace. 
The price tag with an astronomical figure on it was still attached. He explained. Jan bought this the first time we went to New York eight or nine years ago. She never wore it. She was saving it for a special occasion. I guess this is that occasion. He took the slip from me and put it on the bed along with the other clothes we were taking to the mortician. His hands lingered on the soft material for a moment. And then he slammed the drawer shut and said to me, don't you ever save anything for a special occasion. Every day you're alive is a special occasion. I remembered those words through the funeral in the days that followed when I helped him attend all the sad chores that follow an unexpected death. And I thought about those words on the plane as I returned home. I'm still thinking about his words, and they've changed my life. I read more and dust less. I sit on the deck admiring the view now without fussing about the weeds in the garden. I'm spending more time with my family and friends and less time in committee meetings. Whenever possible, life should be a pattern of experiences we savor, not endure. I'm trying to recognize those moments and cherish them. I'm not saving anything. We use the good china and crystal for every special event, like losing a pound or unclogging the sink. I wear my good blazer to the market when I feel like it. I'm not saving my good perfume for special parties. Someday, and one of these days, are fighting a losing battle to stay in my vocabulary. I'm not sure what my sister would have done had she known she wouldn't be here for the tomorrow we all take for granted. I think she would have called family and friends. I think she might have called a few former friends to apologize and mend fences for past squabbles. I think she would have gone out to her favorite restaurant. But I'll never know. I'm trying very hard not to put off, hold back, or save anything that would add laughter and luster to life. And every morning when I open my eyes, I tell myself, this is a special occasion. The Bible says it this way. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be happy in it. Treasure this gift and enjoy every gift It comes from God. Worship him as God. And let him worry about your happiness.